Peace be with you. I can't tell you what a joy it is to be here with you on this celebrating your feast day, particularly because I get to be here with Father Jim Lee, who I've known my entire priesthood. <laughs> Sincerely, no. He, he will recall that it was a little over 20 years ago uh, that I could have been, it was talked about, I could have been your parochial vicar. And I tell you, I wonder what my life would have been like. I probably would be Pope by now, you know. I, uh, <laughs> Just a joke, just a joke, uh, maybe in squim, uh, but you know, and I love squim by the way, no, it's okay, uh, but, uh, but to be here with you, you have always modeled for me what a pastor should look like, and I've always tried to live up to that sincerely, and uh, now as a bishop, I, I certainly hope that I'll measure up, uh, particularly to you, and, and so uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to be here today. And uh, Father Kyle Poggi, uh, you're okay. Uh, no, no, no. You, you guys, <laughs> you you guys give me hope. Uh, you, you, do the younger clergy give you hope? They, they give me hope, and especially this one over here. Uh, really great. So thank you for your saying yes. So, so my friends, some of you might know that I recently returned from Rome. Uh, I had a course of formation uh, that they crammed into a week, uh, which is affectionately called Baby Bishop School. And so that's what I did. And so it was wonderful. It was so wonderful uh, to have that opportunity uh, to get to know other new bishops around the world. And the experience culminated with an audience with the Holy Father. And so that was just a week ago uh, last Monday, so, um, so almost two weeks from tomorrow. And uh, he spent two hours with us in a conversational style meeting where any topic could be discussed and was discussed. Uh, you know, when Pope Francis speaks of his desire uh, for a synodal church, uh, I can tell you that our Holy Father practices what he preaches. Uh, we prayed together, listened together, uh, listened to each other, wrestled with the many difficult issues that the, and challenges the church faces today. And we turned our minds to Jesus, the good shepherd, who laid down his life for his sheep and calls us bishops, indeed priests as well, to do the same. And I'm sure I'll have opportunities, uh, over, you know, over, over the year to keep on sharing more where I go. But uh, however, I just want to let you know that this weekend that the Holy Father's heart is first and foremost interested in your personal faith journey uh, as a parishioner of a local parish. Uh, he's more interested in that than whatever might be happening politically in the world or in the church today. Uh, he reminded us that as bishops, the supreme law of the church is the care of souls. And with faith comes our salvation. It was also wonderful having a full day to simply wander around Rome afterwards on my own. And there's no shortage of paintings, frescoes, and statues of angels in that city. Uh, you know, as many of you have made that trip, no, for, you lived over there, and so you couldn't, you know, uh, you turn without seeing an angel. Uh, and, uh, of course, one of the most remarkable statues that's uh, it, there in Rome stands on top of Castel San Angelo uh, near St. Peter's. Uh, it was not always called San Angelo, however. It was originally called and is still commonly referred to as the Mausoleum of Hadrian. Uh, it was originally called that um, because it was built by Emperor Hadrian to be the final resting place for him and his family. The castle used to be the tallest building in Rome, in fact. It's now dwarfed by St. Peter's right next door. Uh, but if you look closely, there's a fortified passageway 
uh, from the Vatican to the castle that was used to uh, help protect the Pope uh, during times of siege. So how did this mausoleum become known as, known as Castel San Angelo? You know, it may interest you as our world continues to recover from COVID-19 that in the late sixth century, Pope St. Gregory the Great ordered the city to participate in a procession uh, to the Basilica of St. Mary Major to pray through the intercession of our Blessed Mother that they be saved from the plague. Legend has it, uh, as they were praying for deliverance, St. Michael the Archangel appeared on top of the mausoleum of Hadrian and was seen sheathing his sword, heralding the end of the plague. Um, as a result, a statue of St. Michael is erected, or was erected, on top of the, uh, this ancient mausoleum, and the name changed to Castel San Angelo. Interesting, huh? Um, you know, this weekend, we're going to celebrate the feast day of the archangels, Michael, Raphael, and Gabriel. Um, as this parish is founded under the patronage of St. Michael, again, it's an honor uh, to be here with you this weekend. Uh, angels are named such because of the profound role uh, they have played in salvation history, including, uh, indicating, excuse me, their level of leadership in the choir of angels. The name Raphael refers to God's healing, uh, a reference to the archangel healing Tobit uh, from blindness. Uh, the name Gabriel refers to God's might, a reference uh, to him being the herald of the incarnation. The name Michael refers to him uh, as being like God for his role in salvation in history uh, for vanquishing evil. So what are angels? What are angels? Well, St. Augustine taught that angels are pure spirits created by God uh, to serve him for all eternity. Pure spirits are what they are pure spirit. And the word angel, in fact, actually refers to their office, uh, their function, as it were, which is to be divine messengers of God's word to other created beings. This office, this function is important because God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful, no one can see the face of God and live, right? Uh, because God is om omnipotent. No one can see the face of God and live without some form of mediation. A modern analogy could be imagining powering an iPhone uh, by plugging it directly into a nuclear reactor. What would you have if you tried, tried that? You'd have one dead iPhone, right? Uh, the power from a nuclear reactor needs to be mediated, it needs to be filtered, so that the iPhone can get the power it needs uh, through a voltage it can absorb. Angels are the messengers of the divine will in that way. In the book of Genesis, you'll sometimes notice here or there, you know, Abraham first speaking with an angel before the text shifts to a conversation between him and God. So it's an ancient sensibility that God's word, God's presence, his communication has to be mediated through angels. You know, another point worthwhile discussing today is that angels are real. Angels are real. My grandpa, Frank Schuster, uh, told a story uh, once of how during the Great Depression, he found himself on the streets of Chicago, literally starving to death. He was exhausted, just sitting on the steps outside the train station, trying to stay awake in his misery, when a man surrounded by light approached him and told him that there is a relative of his not far away, just a block down, where he could go to and get help. And sure enough, he found a long lost relative on the streets of Chicago through all those people, thousands of people, and he recognized him. Gave him a coat and $10, which back then was, uh, was something, and helped him to get up to his family in Wisconsin. Uh, to his dying day, he told us that it was literally an angel who saved his life. 
I believe him. I believe him. I believe in some, some respect I'm here today because of an angel. Yes, my friends, angels are real. Every one of us has access to an angel who can mediate God's will to us. And let me offer an everyday example of how this can work, all right? Have you ever wondered how the experience of God speaking to you happens so often through strange moments of synchronicity? An odd moment that comes out of nowhere that cannot be a coincidence. Sometimes through a vivid dream that draws on memory or the right song on the radio at the right time or the right word at the right time, sometimes spoken by a friend and even a stranger. You know, it happens. I can't tell you how often people come up to me after mass and say, great homily. And I ask him, well, what part did you like? And it's something completely other than what I was talking about. <laughs> Again, angels, <laughs> angels. You know, these are ways, examples of common examples of God's word being communicated to us and mediated to us in ways that we can understand. That's what angels do. Uh, and uh, and that, when that happens to you, that might very well be your angel at work. However, spiritual masters are right to tell us that when these revelations come to us, they have to be tested. They have to be tested. An easy litmus test is if these moments bring us closer to Jesus and the church, it is of God. If it is pushing us away from Jesus and the church, then it's not. Right? It's not. You see, there are other forces at work in our world other than angels who do not have our best interest at heart, to say the least. My friends, the perfect mediator between God and man is the Son of God himself. Who sees Jesus, you see the Father. Right? Jesus is the Son of God who reveals to us the will of the Father. His body, blood, soul, and divinity are eternal and omnipotent realities, too. They're, they're, and they need to be mediated to us. Uh, as that's what we mean when we speak of sacraments and the true presence. We need a host that can convey that real and eternal and omnipotent presence to us, body, blood, soul, and divinity, the entirety of Christ to us in the sacrament, really and truly as will happen at this Mass today and happens every day in the Catholic Church around the world. In the same way, Scripture, sacred Scripture and tradition, the tradition of the Church, convey to us uh, his revelation in a way that we can understand and is necessary for our salvation. Our angels help us on that journey. They guide us, they push us, if we let them. Even if we don't recognize their existence, they're still at work. You know, they're still at work, communicating the divine will to us in subtle and at times not so subtle ways. However, equally as true, there are evil spirits constantly at work dividing the human race, instilling prejudice, bitterness, and violence. And if you don't believe me, open your newspaper, you know? Uh, just turn on the news and you'll see the devil at work. My friends, in every age, but especially and most assuredly in this age, we are in a spiritual battle. We are in a spiritual battle. And what is at stake in this battle is our very souls. This is why it would serve us well to seek the intercession of the angels and the saints. Because if you, live, if you live long enough, you begin to realize why it is that God would send us a Savior in the first place. He sent us a Savior for the simple reason that we cannot save ourselves. We can't do it. We cannot save ourselves. 
Despite what this culture will tell you, we cannot save ourselves. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. And you have a powerful patron here in Olympia, Washington, in the Archangel St. Michael. That is his purpose. His purpose, like all the angels, is to point us to Jesus. And so let us call upon his intercession right now. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly hosts, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl around the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. And we ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.